I'm Michael Worthington. Um, I grew up in England, uh, went to undergraduate at St. Martin's, came out to California to study graphic design. There's a master's degree in 1993. Um, fell in love with the place, fell in love with Cal Arts as a school, decided I wanted to stay here. Um, started teaching, started independent practice, mostly book design for cultural institutions, and uh, been here ever since. Uh, initially I came here because of what was happening in the early 90s, mostly actually in terms of type design and typography. Um, and it wasn't, at that time, there was no, that kind of experimentation wasn't really happening very much in uh, England, certainly. Um, but also there wasn't much of a kind of critical dialogue around design. Design at that point was still pretty much kind of a, not really a service industry, but it wasn't really asking any larger questions of what it wanted to be, what it might be. Um, and it felt like it was the, you know, at the time it was the most interesting place to be. Um, and everywhere else caught up pretty quickly afterwards, but there, there was a kind of sweet spot, I think, of four or five years where everything that was centralized here, both in terms of form and theory, um, was, you know, really kind of dense and concentrated. It's strange. In some ways, I feel like it's um, radically different and radically the same. Um, there's still, I think, emphasis on a lot of those foundational principles to do with, you know, working as an idiosyncratic designer, to do with experimentation, to do with um, questioning the role of the designer, uh, yeah, the role of the client, all of those kind of things. But at the same time, what we're looking at as form has changed radically. You know, what um, I feel like we're somewhat uh, caught in the past, caught up in our own history in a way. Um, I think the battle over the last kind of 15 years has been really how to, how to escape or build on something that was really, you know, quite interesting and quite successful and not to keep doing the same thing. Like, a, I mean, a parallel might be something like looking at kind of late modernism, you know, in Switzerland and thinking about, well, do you keep making the same work? Do you keep, you know, applying that philosophy? And at some point there's a shift, right? It changes either a change in technology, a change in philosophy that somehow hangs on to, partly hangs on to those principles, but also pushes them in a new direction. I think we're really isolated. Um, I, you know, the joke was always that this place is, you know, when, certainly in the 90s it was in the middle of nowhere and there was nothing around it. So it became its own culture. It fed on itself. It fed on its own influences, on its own ideas. Um, and I feel like that's still true to some extent. It's still something somewhat kind of isolated. But I feel like a lot of those ideas have gone out into the world and, and come back again. So in a way, um, that work that was being produced out of here in the 90s really didn't fit into the larger culture. It was kind of rejected, ostracized, alienated, you know. Um, whereas now I feel like it's, you can see some of that work that's been taken on by mainstream companies, you know, used by mainstream companies. So there's not that sense of isolation anymore. But I feel like the school itself is still pretty isolated in a way that a lot of, um, a lot of academic institutions are. I mean, our concern is always the, you know, how does the individual develop? What is the individual's um, kind of growth and experimentation rather than how does this individual get a job? How does this individual serve a corporation? We're not really interested in that. Sure, I mean, there's definitely, you know, there's waves of everything. So, I mean, what they have in common is this kind of underpinning to do with, you know, complexity, multiple narratives. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like there's, there's times when the aesthetics radically change. I think there was a time in certainly around 2000 where work was much more kind of critical, minimal, um, 
it was less exuberant, it was more conceptually driven, um, it was less form based, less image based, more, you know, more about the idea and the language used perhaps. Um, you know, and I think in the last in the last 10 years, what you've seen is a, a kind of integration of maybe what is a Cal Arts aesthetic with what is a more contemporary aesthetic as well, a more kind of global aesthetic. So those two things have merged. I don't know, one year, uh, a group of students were working on a motion graphics project for me, and they needed to, uh, they needed to simulate an explosion, so they had somebody stand in front of a plate glass window, cover the back of the plate glass window in lighter fluid, and set it on fire. And a you know 14 foot plate glass window shattered with somebody in front of it. That's pretty dodgy. Um, I don't know. I can't think of anything. Craziness. Um, well, we started out, um, we've historically had a lot of students that have gone into the motion industry, partly because it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big deal in LA, it's where all the companies are. Um, and it was also the rise of that as an industry uh, coincided with the availability of technology. So suddenly you could do things in After Effects, you could do things on a regular computer where formerly you had to have, a, you know, a specialized equipment to do that. Um, and that gave birth to a lot of kind of smaller motion graphics companies. Um, and we'd had a group of students who we'd always been interested in that because we'd always been interested in the, you know, the film school here, a lot of work to do with narrative, um, a lot of work to do with animating typography as well. Um, and I think what, what really happened is we had students that were going out and working at those companies and we wanted to kind of capitalize and build on that and to actually try and develop um, both a history of motion graphics and in some ways a curriculum for motion graphics because it felt like it had always been a, a, a kind of add-on. You either have, okay, here's film and we're going to look at film and animation theory, we're going to use that kind of technique for storyboarding for narrative structure, or we're going to look at graphic design and how does a graphic designer work within motion. So the idea was to really try and put those two things together and to see if we could build something that had a um, that had a real curriculum and that focused on motion graphics as a, as a specific practice in the same way that, um, you know, at one point graphic design wasn't really, it was seen as one giant practice, right? So it didn't really have its own history and theory. It wasn't divided up into these smaller sections of, you know, type design, um, design history, uh, illustration. And motion graphics have reached the same point where it kind of became saturated within the culture that it, I feel, felt like it deserved its own kind of curriculum, its own philosophy, you know, its own structure. Um, the issue that we had with the program, um, we had a lot of very successful people go through that program. Um, the issue was more to do with the fact that we were really working at a, at a graduate level and to try and have students that were then going to create a, in some ways a critical uh, piece of work about motion graphics. It was very hard for them to then take that skill set out into the industry, which was very much based on speed, on form. Um, so I feel like in, in, in a lot of ways, that was one fault of it. And then the other, the other thing was that the industry kind of caught up in a lot of ways, that it, that it became, um, Everything started to happen much faster and much cheaper in the motion industry and a lot of the motion companies started to actually expand to not just do motion. Uh, so whereas companies were once doing just film titles or just um, you know, uh, animated idents, suddenly now they're doing websites and branding as well as motion graphics as well as end titles or um, you know, so there's, there's kind of, in a way, it was, there was a moment where it was really isolated as a practice, and I think that was an interesting time to kind of examine it and to look at it. And I think you can look at somebody like, you know, Michael Betancourt, and look at his, you know, History and Theory of Motion Graphics book, you know, that came out at a certain time because that was the time that, it, you know, it was interesting. People were interested in investigating that and in some ways were interested in trying to 
um, kind of codify it or, or describe it as a practice. I really like them. Um, I think there's a lot of really positive things that have come out of it. Um, for instance, there, I think there's a lot of fear that the online education is going to replace in-person education and that's a total falsehood. Um, the online education, the way that we're working with it, is really to look at it in some ways as a textbook. So it's a, um, it's a standalone um, set of knowledge that somebody can dip into. A textbook doesn't replace a teacher, right? A textbook sits alongside the teacher, they have different roles. Here's a book, you read it, then you have questions, and it gives you a base knowledge that allows you to then progress in a more advanced way with that student for them. So it gets rid of, in a way, a lot of the, um, the foundational knowledge. Um, it gives people a kind of head start, so that, that's one thing that's really important. And the other thing is it serves a totally different role. We're, I mean, I'm teaching in an institution that costs $50,000 a year. Um, there's only a certain amount of people that can afford that, right? Whereas these massive online, um, you know, learning courses, they go all over the world, they cost, you know, you can take a course for $10, $20, well, some of them are free as well. And it means that they can have uh, a lot of change and a lot of social impact in countries. So we've seen a lot of impact in countries like China, especially in India. Um, where we've got feedback where these courses have actually really changed people's lives. So something as small as this course could, could mean that somebody can be, okay, I don't have to do this job I didn't want to do, my parents were telling me. I can do this training, I want to be creative, I can be a graphic designer, I can start my own practice. We've had people take the courses and use them in classrooms themselves, so that it's become, there's become a kind of knock-on effect of that. So I feel like in a lot of ways, um, you know, the education at CalArts is, is, is very focused for a very small amount of individuals. And the online education is really about um, something for the, the greater good in a lot of ways. I feel like this, it's had more kind of positive impact in the world. And it's had, actually had, probably had more ability to change people's lives radically. And again, in the same way that a textbook is, that you might, you know, if you didn't know anything about design and you picked up, you know, Phil Meg's history graphic design book for the first time, you'd be like, wow, this stuff is cool, I really want to do this. It's an so it's an entry point. And I feel like that's felt, um, felt really positive as, as, as something to contribute to. I'm not sure it differs entirely from every other institution. I think one of the things that makes it um, I wouldn't even say that it's different anymore. I feel like there's a lot of overlap between most institutions. I would say what's at the core of CalArts, though, is the idea of making and form first, and the idea of the individual as a maker first. I mean, I love to use the word idiosyncratic because it gets, it gets across the idea of the individual, but the individual is this kind of maker that's following their own path. And I feel like that's at the, the core of CalArts. Um, you know, there's a conceptual and a formal component to there that we want people to be, um, you know, investigating something that's important, to be kind of rigorous about what they're doing, to, um, for it to actually be investigating ideas through form as well. And those are quite big and vague things. It's not that they're not happening in other institutions. I think those things are happening everywhere. Um, and I think increasingly as we've seen less and we see more and more schools, particularly at the higher end, become less kind of servants to corporations, right? Now it's, you know, whereas it used to be kind of Yale, Cranbrook, and CalArts that were these schools where you went there to be, um, to find yourself, to find what kind of designer you wanted to be. I think that's true of nearly every school now because that's true of most of design practice now. Um, so I feel like the, you know, the, the pedagogy part if anything, the part of it that, that perhaps sets it aside, I think, is still a belief in form, a belief in formal experimentation, and a belief in the in the value of that, and in the, in the value of the individual. I think that's that's the key thing that we're not necessarily interested in um, work that succeeds but looks the same as every other piece of contemporary work. Somehow there has to be some part of the individual, whether it's 
conceptual, whether it's research, whether it's strategic, whether it's formal typographic, there has to be that component in there for it to have value. I think that's the key thing. I mean, I started out with a very hybrid practice. I mean, I started out doing motion graphics in the early days of the web, actually pre-web doing CD-ROM interfaces. Um, you know, working a lot with programming, but also working a lot with analog as well. So um, I've always really liked the physicality of print, whether that's screen printing or whether it's the materials that go into making a book. So there's, uh, I've always wanted to have a, some kind of practice that involved everything. Right? But at some point, you actually have to focus on things. So I reached a point where um, it felt like there wasn't the range of creativity that I want to explore in Web 1.0. Um, I didn't have the time to commit to, being, to working on motion graphics projects with intense deadlines. And the thing that actually worked with the teaching schedule was actually books and publications because they have a long... Um, quite a long timeline, quite a long schedule. You work on them piecemeal. I really enjoy the kind of cultural part of it, of engaging with that content. So every time I work on a project, I feel like I'm learning something because you have to figure out, you have to learn all about the content of that book. So I learn about some historical movement or some other artist. And I feel like that's been um, pretty rewarding and allowed me to kind of keep myself interested as a designer in my own practice. Um, so over the last you know, 20 years, certainly 15 years, most of what I've been doing has been focused on editorial work and some identity work for cultural institutions. Um, so yeah, a lot of books for museums, East Coast, West Coast. Um, right now, the projects that I'm working on, apart from um, a couple of museum books, um, one project is the Poster Archive, which we can talk a little bit more about later and the publication that goes along with that. And the other project is, uh, I work with my wife, who's an artist, so we're designing a um, design for uh, an MTA station in, in Los Angeles, so two whole platforms in an end bay, which is a giant, incredibly complicated photo collage that I've been making um, that is 170, two pieces that are 170 feet by eight feet each, so the largest and most complex Photoshop files you've ever had to deal with. Sure. So one of the things we, I mean, you talked briefly about Coursera and one of the things about doing these online courses is the one of them was quite successful, so it generated some revenue. The deal with the school was that revenue kind of came back to the design program so we get to decide how it's spent. So we've used some of that money to create an archive. Um, there's been a collection of posters floating around for years that have been kind of housed in an ad hoc manner. So we managed to use that money to create a physical space to actually house the posters, a digital space online. Um, and then we also want to create a book that, um, that records and archives all of those posters, or some of those posters as well. So it's been a multi-stage process. It's a three-year project, start to finish. So we have the physical space built with that houses the, the actual posters now. Um, we've been photographing them, putting them up online, and then crowdsourcing missing information. Because a lot of these posters, go, they go back to the 80s, the 70s. Some of them we don't know who made them, we don't know what year they are. So we've actually been trying to use the alumni network by putting stuff up online and trying to fill in missing pieces of information. Um, the next component of it is to you know, finish the book, which will be a selection of those posters, um, and also several essays by, um, by alumni and by faculty. And then next spring, there'll be a, an exhibition at Red Cat as well that will go along with the book too. And, the, and I mean, really the main goal in it was that there's this, you know, there's this insane archive here we have I think we don't even know how many posters we have. I think we have two and a half thousand online right now. We have at least another thousand that are shot and not put up online, and more than that. And we continually, the students continue to submit posters, you know, during the semester. So it's an ongoing process. At some point, we'll hopefully catch up. 
But the idea was that it's, uh, it's this really interesting kind of visual trajectory of, of both the history of des graphic design at CalArts, but also the history of CalArts itself. So you can track through it and look at who came to visit when, what filmmakers were here, um, you know, what kind of musicians were here. So you look through it and it's suddenly, oh look, hey, John Cage was here in you know, 1972, that's pretty cool. Oh, 1998, Lou Reed was here, that's pretty amazing. So the posters are really made to publicize events on campus. So um, they're really used just on campus. So again, they're very insular in the same way that, that CalArts is this very self-contained microcosm of, of kind of culture and of production. Um, so the posters can be anything from somebody very famous coming to talk at CalArts, an artist perhaps, or a curator, or a musician performing, or a theater production, to a student's trombone recital. Um, they can really be anything and some of them are commissioned, uh, some of them are produced by students just on their own through friends, they're hung up around the hallways of the school, they rarely make it to the outside world. Most of them are produced using the uh, archaic production means of screen printing um, and so that lends to a set of limitations but also it also lends to a set of commonalities as well. So they, they hold together as this really interesting body of kind of experimental work because of those similarities, because, because those things haven't changed in you know, 40, 50 years. But in a lot of ways, you know, the means of production, the site that they're going to be um, displayed in, um, the amount of information that they have to communicate, the fact that they're nearly all produced really quickly and on a really short deadline, some of them you know, overnight. Um, and then in a larger sense, the other kind of commonality is that they're, they're part of a larger kind of training system for the students, that they're a place where the faculty has no oversight in these posters. They're really the students um, trying things out for themselves in this very quick and almost throwaway kind of way. None of them are masterpieces. None of them were meant to be, like I'm making an awesome poster that's gonna be in a book. A lot of these were like fast, done really quickly, I think because of that there's kind of an energy and a vitality and there's a kind of an exuberance and sometimes there's a willingness to kind of try things out and take risks and I think that makes it a really interesting body of work as well. And there's plenty of failures in there. There's some spectacularly beautiful failures and some terribly ugly failures. But it's, in a way it's evidence of learning. I think that's what's interesting to me about it as a body of work. It isn't the posters are standalone masterpieces. It's about how do these, how do these, how does this set of posters kind of evidence a pedagogy or evidence, evidence a history of experimentation within an institution. Um, oof. That's too hard to pick one this, out of three thousand. Um, let me think. Yeah, there's um, there's a poster that I really like. That's um, I, I, ironically enough, there's so much complexity within those posters and so much exuberance that the, the ones that stand out to me are often the most simple ones, or often the ones that are perhaps um, more conceptual in strategy and more minimal in form. So there's a you know. Um, a Megan McGinley and Max Ehrenberger poster for Julie Burley that's basically just a hairy man with a stick with the, with the title of it shaved into his back. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's really simple but it becomes this kind of, you know, iconic image. Um, yeah, I can't pick one. <laughs> that's impossible.